The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. So, um, in the next hour we're going to be talking about how to extend salt um, in the most basic and straightforward ways. And that's going to be making your own modules, extending that base API that we've been talking about, and how to make your own states. And um, just as a reference, in January of this year, I believe that we had five state modules and about 20 salt modules. And right now, we've got just shy of 80 salt modules and um, somewhere in the vicinity of 20 state modules. Uh, the, what I'm trying to get at is not only have we had a lot of people contribute modules and state modules to salt, but they can generally do it rather quickly. It's the, again, the goal is to make everything that you do to interact with salt as easy and intuitive as possible. Okay. Now, we're going to go over how to make two very core extension pieces inside of SALT. Primarily the modules and, and the state modules, or SALT states. Now, right now there are six extension points inside of SALT. There's modules, states, renderers, which is what, um, which is what you allows you to write SLS files in something other than YAML Jinja. Runners, which allows you to do master sign complicated reporting. Um, grains, which we discussed, we can extend grains fairly easily. And um, returners, which allows you to redirect the return information from a salt command to any arbitrary location. So we're going to start by talking about these two. The next, the next hour is going to talk about the remaining four, how they work, how to interact with them, how to use them, and how to extend them. Okay. Now, we're going to start off by talking about salt modules. I've already shown you a few of those, the fact that they're just plain Python, mo Python modules. But there's a lot of extra things that you can do inside of them to extend their capability. And you've got access to quite a few goodies, so to say, so to speak, inside of them. Um, we're also going to cover how to use um, the Python quargs and args capabilities inside of modules, particularly state modules. They let you pass in and deal with some very arbitrary data so that you can assign arbitrary data. You're, you can make a state that supports putting just some extra random garbage of anything that you'd like, so to say, into, into an SLS file for a state, and that can be absorbed and utilized if you want it to be inside of, inside of the actual SLS. And then inside of solid states, we're going to talk about how these data structures actually map back over to the actual code. Um, hopefully, from a programming perspective, it should be intuitive. And actually, that mapping right there is generally when people, the light bulb goes on and they say, oh, that's how states work. Because um, they look at the code and they go, oh, that just makes sense. So hopefully we're able to continue on with that tradition. <laughs> OK. Salt modules. Again, just Python modules. When we run the remote execution and we did PK and we do test.ping, it's test module, ping function. Let's start taking a look at some of these and look at how they're structured and what we can do with them. OK. Four hundred ninety nine watchers. Sorry. We're almost there. Almost to five hundred. Somebody get on GitHub and watch us. <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right. So modules. 
Uh, despite the fact that it may look like we've got a, we've got a lot of these, um, we can have modules to integrate with almost any piece of software that you can run. I mean, we've got, we've got some, I think, fairly intuitive ones in here. Um, like, it's actually a pretty, pretty bad cross-section. <laughs> Let's try this one. I like this cross-section better for, this, for what I'm trying to say. So interfacing with RabbitMQ, interfacing with um, users and groups on FreeBSD, interfacing with Puppet, um, Postgres, PIP, Pac-Man, so Arch Linux package support, Mac desktop stuff, um, Nginx, MySQL, MooseFS. Who here knows what MooseFS is? That's what I thought. <laughs> MooseFS is a, is a uh, distributed file system. But anyway, you can interface with pretty much any piece of software. In the long run, we should have access to thousands of modules as this module base continues to grow. And if you have a piece of software that you want to integrate with, with SALT, and you write a module, and it's public software, um, then give us the module. We want it. We want to grow this library. We want it to be as large as possible, as powerful as possible. OK. So let's dive into the test module, which is very simple, pretty straightforward, um, and, allows a, and, and is generally used to test some interfaces. So we go down and we see that they're just, again, just functions. Now, these functions can take arbitrary arguments or not take arguments. So if it takes te text here with the echo function, let me hop over and demonstrate what this looks like. We're on the right system. We pass an argument. OK. And so when I say foobar right here, it's going to be passed in as the first argument to this function. That screen, which is text. And all echo does is return text. And we have a functional component. Okay. All right. Now let's talk about some of the goodies, some of, the some of the extra things that we have inside of these modules to work with. Right out, we've got cross-calling. So this is great. We've got this big library of modules that are specifically designed and loaded for salt. Well, if I'm in one module, then it would only make sense that I would want to have access to a different module. Because, I mean, it's an API, right? So what we can do is we can cross-call other modules. Now, the actual way that salt modules are loaded is that they're loaded up and then embedded with a bunch of extra information so that you can do things like cross-call and you can pull up specific data. This is something that, that we can't intuitively do just with normal Python imp um, imports. And so the loader functionality embeds these extra these extra bits of data that we're going to talk about. And so we've got this one, underscore, underscore, salt, underscore, underscore. And this is a dictionary of all of the other functions. And we can just call them. So let's take a look at, uh, there we go. There'll be some good stuff in here. So I want to shell out. So I'm going to call the command module. It's got a run function. And it takes as an argument a string that I'm going to execute and returns standard out. So I'm just going to use that. I'm going to use that instead of doing all the subprocess stuff. Now primarily, we like to use this in this case because it logs that it happened. It logs that this command got executed. But we see very, very quickly that that's how we make these calls. Because this salt object here is a dictionary 
the keys are function calls and the values are, or the keys are function names and the values are function objects so that we can cross call other functions. Okay. And we see a lot of shelling out as one might expect inside of a module that's doing package management. All right. Next we have access to grains. So, as one might expect, we might want to make a module behave slightly differently based on um, system information. So if it's a different operating system, then we need it to do something slightly different, um, and then so on. So we have access to all of the grains via a grains dictionary. If we take a look back at this, um, back at this Pac-Man module, is that we're accessing the OS grain right up here. Next, we've got, uh, we've got access to all of the options that have been passed to the minion. So you can put arbitrary data inside of the minion config file and it'll be available to all of the modules that you have on that minion. All right. Those are the important embedded bits. Next, we've got something called the virtual function. Now, if we go back, and if you recall, we go back to here, and we do a solve pkg dot, um, let's say list packages. Okay. Okay, well, I called that pkg. I didn't call it yum package. And, but, but it knew to use yum to get all of this package information, right? So how do we make sure that all of these things are mapped to the right locations? And that's done via the virtual function. So we see up here that we've got this virtual function. And it's going to return one of two things. If the virtual function is omitted, then it's going. Then the then the module is going to show up by whatever whatever the file itself is named. Otherwise, if the virtual function is available, then it's going to be executed, and it's going to be known to salt by whatever the string is that's returned. Or if you return false, it's just not going to load it. So if I'm running a Fedora system, then why the devil would I ever load the package management? stuff for arch. So it would return false. So this very, very basic methodology is how we map what modules to load in place of what providers. Okay? Any questions there? All right. Um, the virtual function is used a lot, uh, and and for for a lot of uh, a lot of modules that get submitted, we 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 have to bounce back and say, can you please provide a virtual function for this? Um, but as you saw, and as you'll see with other modules, uh, the virtual function is generally not particularly complicated. It just returns a string if it's going to be named something specific. That's it. Okay. Again, the goal, simple interfaces. Okay. Next, we have the outputter system. Now, back in the day, back in, say, last September, so eons ago in, in salt time, um, you would execute a <coughs> command on the command line with salt. It would return the data to you, and it would print out that data in raw Python. And it was incredibly difficult to read and not too particularly useful. And so we added in 
the outputter system. The outputter system allows you to say this function, when it returns, it's going to be printed a certain way to the terminal. That's why if we come over here, nope, that one. Okay. And we do package.list packages, which gives us a dump of all the packages installed on the minions and what versions they are. Okay. And then we do something like run a command, that output looks pretty different. I mean, we've got, we've got a pretty printed data structure up here of, of raw Python. And down here, we've got a textual output of exactly what the command ran, OK? And so that's all done via this outputter system. I, I really like this because we can run a command, and we see that this is what you know, minion, that's what it would look like if we run it locally. Very, very grokkable. All right, so let's take a look at how the outputter system works. Oh. CMD. CMD is actually a really good example. One, because it's not named CMD, and so it's got to use a virtual function. This is great because we wanted the we wanted the name to actually be CMD, but if we name it CMD, then we can't import the Python module CMD to actually work with. So we had to name the file something different. So we had to be a little creative there, but we can still call it CMD inside of salt. So it's still terse and direct. Um, and then we've got the outputter system here. We define this dictionary called outputter. And then we define a function, run, and then the outputter that we're going to use. So we can output things either as text, which is what I just showed you with the command.run. We can output things the default way, which is to use Python's pretty printer module. We can output things in JSON, or we can output things in um, YAML. Uh, or if you do a high state run and you're thinking, and you may you may be thinking, wait, wait, wait. When you ran high state, it gave you this real specific colored output. That's because we have an outputter specifically for high state returns. And so you can write a module that's going to give some complex data and then go in and write an outputter that's going to be, give you a very specific view of, uh, of how that data is going to be represented on the, on the screen so that you control the complete user experience, so to speak, of how someone's going to be interacting with your function. Okay. Oh, output modes can be overwritten. So I can run a command and say, no, 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 give that to me in JSON, because I like to read things that way. OK. Actually, to be clearer, if you're shelling out from another application, and you want to bring some data in, and you don't want to have to, you know, parse it. <laughs> you can just pass to that command JSON out or YAML out or something, and then bring it in as, as JSON. Okay. But so you can overwrite that outputter when you're actually executing commands. Now, quarks and modules. This is actually a fairly recent addition. Um, but so inside of Python, who, who here has who here's written Python before? Oh, that's good. We've got a fairly good spread here. Um, inside of Python, 
if you have a function or a method and they accept an argument that starts with two asterisks and generally you call that, you call it quarks, then any keyword arguments that you pass into that function get absorbed. For a long time, Salt couldn't handle this very well. Um, but now uh, we can. So we can declare command, we, we, can, we can make um, keyword arguments when we make the actual Salt call, and they'll get translated in. And so you can have arbitrary keyword arguments. Now, the, the example here, because you're probably going, I don't understand why this matters. Um, the good example here is let's look at one of these package managers. Package managers all deal with things rather differently. And some of them have certain capabilities that others do not. And so if we come down here and look at yum package, and we find install, there we go, we see that it's accepting quarks. Heavens, not using them, that's embarrassing. The <laughs> I'm running through my brain now trying to remember which package manager I intended to pull up that I know uses quarks. <coughs> Excuse me, so I should have muted for that, I apologize. Okay. There we go. Ah, we were using it. <laughs> so this is, in Pac-Man, Pac we can specify that a file is greater than, less than, or equal to certain versions. And so we've got support to pass in these extra G, greater than, less than, or equal to arguments, or keyword arguments. And since we're taking quarks in here, then we can actually arbitrarily add greater than version number, less than version number, et cetera, flags into an SLS file. And then those will make it all the way back to this base function and change the functionality for you. Which means that when you write a package provider, you can embed things specific to just that package provider inside of quarks, and they will be available um, they'll be available inside of SLS files and inside of states because they're being brought in in a generic way. And um, they're not going to interfere with any other behavior of the system because if you put extra data in an SLS that's not applicable, it's just ignored. So somebody would be able to put in information that's pertinent to a specific package manager and then it's going to still automatically work with multiple uh, with multiple package management backends without throwing a fit. Okay. Now, does anybody have any questions on these modules before we move into state modules and how they work? Okay. All right, state modules. So all of these, the baseline execution modules are in the modules directory here. All the state modules are in the states directory. All right. Uh, file. There we go. This is our example. And then we're going to look at file. All right. File is probably the scariest and hairiest of all state modules because there's a lot that goes on on a file system. But we can come down here. I think I've already mentioned that if there's an underscore, they're ignored by the system, so they're only local. Rather, they become private functions. 
And so let's get down to one of those functions that we were actually using. I know, I should have hit control F a long time ago. Now, symlink. So if we're in an SLS file, and we, and we say file.symlink, <coughs> what happens? We're going to be declaring arguments for the, for, in this SLS file. So the ID declaration, as we, we recall, becomes the name. And we can overwrite it by saying name somewhere in line. And then we would specify an argument. Target would specify an argument for us at make do if we wanted to. And then salt is going to read in that data from the SLS file, um, inspect the function, find out what arguments it takes, and then line up the right arguments from the SLS file and, and overlay them directly onto the function, which means that there is a one-to-one -one mapping of the data that you pass into an SLS file and the function, and the function arguments themselves. So. What this means is that file.symlink actually, uh, let me do it with file.managed. Okay, because we've got an example right here. As we can see, file.manage takes a lot of arguments. Only one of them is mandatory, name. If you pass, um, if you pass into file.manage just name, all it's going to do is make sure that the file exists. That's it. It won't try and download it from anywhere or anything like that. But so we've got name. Source, source hash, user group mode, template makers, context for place, etc. And here we've got name, file.managed, which is file.managed, source, which is source, user, user, etc. Direct mapping. The, the, the act of creating the function inside of a state file also creates all of the available arguments which can be passed to it in a state file. So there's no extra layer there. All right. And then we'll also notice or recall, Oh, I don't have a requisite statement here. But you recall that we could also do that require thing so that we could require something else happens before. And there's no require option in here. And so some of those are just global options that get passed in. So we don't need to worry about them when we're writing state functions. OK. So we're down here in a state file. There's a couple of things of things to note. One is that all of those goodies that I talked about, that underscore, underscore, salt, underscore, underscore, which allows you to call modules, you have access to those inside of states. You have access to grains inside of states. You have access to options inside of states. You have access to underscore, underscore, pillar, underscore, underscore, inside of states. So all that data we talked about in normal modules is available in state modules. Okay. So. The difference being is that state modules have a few requirements to make them function properly. Um, and really, there's three main requirements. The first is that a state module must always take the argument name. And it, must, and it should be the first argument. That's pretty easy to follow. The second requirement is that it must return a dictionary that looks like this. I mean, this is the backbone of how states works, saying that it's always going to return something that we expect that's going to give us the information that we need based on what occurred. 
And so as you recall, when we were looking at the, at the console after running states, it said result true, name, name, comment, and what all the changes were. This is the dictionary that's just re returned raw from this function. And then that's added into the total return data and reported back. The last thing that you need is this test interface, OK? So what this does is let's say that we don't want, we want to do a dry run of the states. We just want to see what SALT plans on doing. We don't want to actually do it, OK? And let me go back and demonstrate how that works. It doesn't work like that. Okay. All right. So what this has done is it's gone out and it said Nginx is already installed, swapping is already set at the right value, but we're going to try and start Nginx. But it didn't actually apply anything. It didn't try to start Nginx. It just looked in and said, are we going to? And so if we were declaring a lot of files in this situation, then it would give us a diff and say, these files are going to be diffed this way. If we're installing packages, we're going to say, these packages are going to be installed this way. And those always come back in yellow, and their result is none, because they didn't do anything. All right, so the test interface is going to return the same functionality. What you do is you see if test is inside of the options that have been passed in. If it is, then you don't want to do anything. OK. Any questions so far? Is anyone just wildly bewildered a little bit? A little too much information too quickly? You're a doer, yes. We're, we're still working on getting a bunch of demo runs and, uh, and exercises put together for these things. So we'll definitely have those next year itself. Anyway. Right, after I get some sleep and I have more employees. <laughs> All right, I think I've already mentioned this. If you pass quarks into the into states, it does the same thing. It grabs any extra data that's in the SLS file and passes it in. The first argument has to be name. And it has to return that standard return structure or data structure. And that's it. Other than that, they're just plain Python modules. Okay. Um, again, to go over the return data really quickly, the name, we just copy the name that was the name value that was passed in directly into the return data. The changes has to be a Python dictionary. And it's going to be a key value list of everything that has changed or will be changed if, you, if you're running a test interface. The result, true, if everything went swimmingly, meaning that either true if nothing changed or something changed successfully. False if it failed. None if it didn't do anything. And then a comment. So that we've got a nice little blurb that says, Hey, just so you know, Bob, this, this is what I just did to your system. OK, the test interface, um, as I demonstrated, allows you to do a dry run. And we, and we need to have it, and you always need to have a test interface inside of your modules. Granted, if you submit upstream to me, 
a state module that is missing the test interface, I'll probably accept it and write the test interface myself. Because I'm far, far more interested in getting contributions from people and getting them excited about being part of this project than I am about browbeating them into writing code the exact same way that I think it should always be written. I'm more than happy to f clean a few things up. And the result that we found there is that people end up just writing better code in the long run. And if there's anything the world needs more of, it's guys writing better code, right? <laughs> OK. That was a little shorter than I thought it was going to be. Now, if you guys want to write your own modules, then just try it out with a salt install sometime. Just drop those modules into the install path. That's the, that's the quickest way to do it. Um, and then just use salt call to run them. And that's all it takes. Uh, if, if, you, if you're trying to write modules, if you're trying to put extensions into salt, and you're having any problems, and actually, if you're having any problems at all with salt, um, one, check out the documentation. It's very extensive. My, my, gen, my general uh, thought is that you guys are going to leave here going, you talked about a lot of stuff. <laughs> but then you're going to go back and you'll walk through a couple of tutorials and you'll say, oh, okay, this isn't that difficult. And you'll look back and you'll look at those SLS files and you'll go, there wasn't a whole lot there. They were pretty small. <laughs> and you'll get it quickly. But we have all of the tutorials on the docs that are going to help step you through everything you need to do to get acquainted with what's going on with SALT. When you run into snags, or if you run into snags, um, we have a very lively IRC channel, which is Pound Salt on Freenode. Um, we have a very lively uh, mailing list. I will be late to respond every, every now and then to mailing lists if I'm at a conference. <laughs> but generally, um, either me or, our, or, some, or, or a member of our community is going to be really quick to respond to your questions. We, we really want to get more people in, involved in SALT, and we're doing everything that we can to make it intuitive, despite the fact that there is a lot of information. The goal is that SALT is kind of like Vim, in that if you know about escape colon WQ, you can use Vim. But it's extremely powerful once, you get, once you're able to dive in deeper. So you can have a shallow learning curve, but you're able to work into the fact that there's so many more capabilities. But so in a nutshell, um, ask questions of the community. There's a lot of people here to help and here to help you get going. And again, in the long run, what's occurred in, uh, or what generally occurs with people using SALT is that, they, is that once they get, get their feet wet, they understand it quickly. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Astris. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Astris, our requirements were pretty simple. 
We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astro Space Systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astro or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astros. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Astros, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Astros cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Astros convoy communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think. When you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens. Uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is a key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch 
where they would spin up, uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. Then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack.